Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Good morning. Time to rise and shine and worship our Lord. Amen? Give God the glory. Amen. Give God the glory, yeah. You guys, I trust you're all doing well and you're ready. You come ready this morning just to receive of the Lord and just with that anticipation. If you haven't got the anticipation or the expectation, just take a moment and say, Lord, give me a heart and, and a desire to expect from you. Lord, just to hear from you and, and to know your name and, Lord, just to be drawn closer to you and to know more about you as the, the study goes through and just the fellowship, Lord, and all these things. Uh, Lord, we just come to you and we ask God that you would just bless our time together. And truly, Lord, as we leave this place today, Lord, just knowing that we've been with you and we've spent time with you. Uh, we just pray, God, that you would just bless our time together. And Lord, we also just want to lift up really quickly the Phillips family and asking God for just your grace upon them, Lord, as they as they go through that process of losing their, their loved one, Lord. Um, we just pray, God, that you just give them comfort and just mercy and grace and just that peace that passes all understanding. I also want to pray for uh, Pastor Bob uh, up in Oroville, Lord, Bob Scott uh, just found out this, this last couple of days that his wife has uh, cancer uh, in her lung and in her back. And uh, Lord, we just want to lift him before you now and pray, God, that you just surround him with your love and, and your grace and mercy. We pray that, Lord, as they go to the oncologist and they begin just the treatment and the, you know, just where it's at and what stage. I pray, God, that you would just touch Denise. And Lord, just take that cancer completely away. Um, according to your will and your purpose and plan. We pray, God, that you give the doctors wisdom, Lord, beyond their years. That they would know and they would see very quickly, Lord, what the problem is. But Lord, ultimately, we just pray that you'd heal her. And Father, just be with us this morning as we worship you and praise you and give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You can stand if you like. Blessed be your name. In the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name On the roads marked with suffering For there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name If we can't see you pour out I'll turn back to pray When the darkness oozes in Lord Still I will say Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. 
you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say the blessed be your name you give and take away you give and take away choose to say the blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your Be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Word can take a dying man, raise him up to life again. What can heal a wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? What can fill the emptiness? What can mend our brokenness? Brokenness. Restores our faith in God. What reveals the Father's love? What can lead the wayward home? What can melt the heart of stone? What can free the guilty one? What can save and overcome? Overcome.
the power of Yes, mighty The power of The cross Give me seated if you like I see the work of your hands Galaxies spin in a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are So overwhelming And I hear the sound of your voice All at once it's a gentle and thundering noise Oh God, all that you are So overwhelming I delight myself in you Captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed Oh, 
shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to my life 
Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure, you are good, always true, you're all alive, you're breaking through, you are more than enough, you are here, you are love. Children and their children 
and their children. May His presence go before you and beside you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Amen. 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 bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace and give This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Shall stand. All I have within me, I give. God, mold us and shape us into your image. You are perfect, God. You're beautiful. You're mighty. You're omniscient. God, we, we love you so much. 
We thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives in us and guides us and teaches us and comforts us. Lord God, we pray that your will would be done and your kingdom would come. Be glorified in us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Concord. It's good to have you with us today, those who are present with us and those who are joining us online. Welcome to the service. Enjoyed the worship this morning. It's good to come and, and sing the praises of the Lord and, and reassure our hearts that he is still in control, that if you read the end of the book, we win. Looking forward to the day of reckoning when we worship around the throne all together, and we've had some this past week that have gone on before us. Daryl Phillips went to be with the Lord this past week, and we want to pray for his family, for Maggie and the family, that God would give them a peace of heart, give them a hope. And uh, there's others uh, that are, are ill today, and we want to pray for them that God would move in and touch them. Now, we're going to be losing some folks coming up here real quick, and they're sneaking out the door right now. There he goes. We're going to lose Sienna and Billy. They're going to be, Billy's getting a horse named Trigger and a dog named Bullet. They're going to Texas. He's going to be a cowboy. And uh, I, uh, I, I say that in jest. I, I, when I joined the service, uh, I, got, I got to Texas, to San Antonio for boot camp, and there was a fellow on the train, and, and he was just so excited because he, he was going to get to Texas, and he was going to get a horse and a dog. And uh, he, never, he never quite made it through boot camp. They sent him home. But uh, no, it's, uh, it's good to be with you today. And uh, we need to pray for our country. We need to pray for all the turmoil and, uh, and, and all that's going on, that God's peace would come upon us, that we would turn to him, get back to him, and make him the main thing in our lives. I just love you guys. It's so good to be here with you. My wife and I are going to take off this week for a little time and, and of relaxation. And we pray that you would uh, support this week, you know, is, is uh, the shoebox ministries. And we are the collection point here at uh, Calvary Chapel Concord. It's going to start tomorrow morning. What time, Britt? From noon to 8 p.m. From noon until 8 p.m. Every day this week, we need volunteers to come. Uh, not only will they be bringing the shoeboxes in here, we'll be packing them, and they will have semi-trailers out here that we have to load them in. So we need all the help we can get from you if you'd join us. If you could, give us just a little time. If you can come for a couple hours, that will help. We would just really appreciate those who could come and help. Let's stand together this morning. We're going to be reading the first 18 verses of Psalm 118. I'll read the odd verse, and you can join me on the even verses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy, mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is for me, among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, but the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my 
the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous, and the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, and he has not given me over to the death. Father, we thank you so much for another day that we can gather together and collectively worship you. Father, we give this day to you. We give this time to you, and we pray that as we set your Holy Spirit will permeate our bodies. Help us to fill our buckets today with the good that you have for us. Be a pastor as he brings the message you've laid on his heart, Lord. Give him the strength and, and what he needs. Touch him today. We touch him not only spiritually, but we pray you touch him physically. He's got this hip issue, and we pray, Lord, that you would work these things out for him. He's facing this surgery. Go before him. Be with the doctors and the nurses and prepare him for this time. Father, we pray for Maggie and the family at the loss of of Daryl, father and, and, and husband. And Lord, we, we don't, our hearts are, are heavy. It's a humanism in us. That's part of us. That's what we're made up of. But Father, we rejoice in the fact to know he's walking with you. He's in your presence at this time, rejoicing with a new body. And Father, we pray that you would help us through times like this to understand, have our hearts right, be ready in the immediate at the coming of the Lord. We know it's not going to be long, and we look forward to that day. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leadership. We pray for all that is going on in our country. Father, we pray that your blessings would pour out across this country. Bring us to revival. Bring us to our knees, Father, that we will worship you. We love you so much. Now we pray that you would be with the rest of the service. This this week, Lord, we, we pray your blessings upon the, the uh, shoebox ministry. Oh, Father, give us the help we need and give us the strength we need and help it as we give these gifts out that your spirit would go with them and touch hearts of many young people. We love you so much. Now we give this service to you and we look forward to all the things you have us have for us today. We pray these things in your precious name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Welcome back, church. These are your announcements for the week of November 15th. The Operation Christmas Child National Collection Week starts tomorrow. See Britt if you'd like to come down to the church during the week and help out. We are sad to announce that Billy and Sienna are moving to Texas at the end of this month. Please join us for a Going Away Fellowship, Sunday, November 29th, after service. There will be a list of items posted at the front desk for you to bring. That's it for this week's announcements. We'll see you back here on Wednesday and then again on Sunday. Bye! God is good. All the time. time. You guys are getting pretty good at that. We'll have to go on the road. Let's open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 12. I just want to encourage you guys too, if you can help throughout the week next week. And I, but you have a schedule for a sign-up schedule? So there's a sign-up schedule. And uh, you know the, and sometimes they come in like crazy. And then sometimes it's just really slow, and we never know when is which and when and all that stuff. But if you guys uh, have time, you know, to come down and just hang out, it's good fellowship, and uh, it's just amazing to watch as the boxes begin to come in. And we're praying that they will still come in this year. Um, you know, with the COVID, that's, that's really put a, um, a stop, so to speak, in a lot of people's minds and trying to figure out how to best do it and and minister in that way. But we're trusting the Lord will will overcome those obstacles and we'll do a wonderful work. But we do need... And and also, if you are close enough to the church, if you want to be put on a a call list, we could do that as well. Um, So that if we get, you know, some car that drives up and they have 250 boxes, we go, hey, (laughs) need help. (laughs) So... 
All right, Acts chapter 12, the day of Pentecost. The church is born. And it began with the Holy Spirit filling those believers. As the apostles preached about Jesus, the church began to grow exponentially. And by chapter 7, the church was beginning to experience persecution because nobody or the ones that were against them didn't want them around. And Stephen was the first one to die for his faith. With the persecution, though, the church began to scatter. And the message of the gospel actually increased as more people heard about it. One of the men behind it we know was Saul. Saul, who began to just chase down these believers and to put them in prison and to kill them. But when Saul was headed for the city of Damascus to pursue those Christians, he was knocked off his horse by that light and he had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus changed his life. We're going to see Saul coming to us in the next few weeks, our few chapters with a new name, Paul. Um, but here we see really a new chapter in the history of the church because now God begins to save the Gentiles. And we've seen the gospel go as far north as the city of Antioch where a growing number of Gentiles are coming to know the Lord. Barnabas and Paul spend a year up in Antioch teaching these new believers, these new Christians. And then we ended last week with Barnabas and Paul being sent with a financial gift down to Jerusalem to help with the coming famine. And while they're there, some interesting things take place. Notice verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Now whenever Herod's name appears in Scripture, it's easy to get confused. You say, well, wasn't Herod the one that killed all the infants when Jesus was born? And Didn't he die in Matthew chapter 2? If so, what is he doing here? And the answer to those questions lie in the fact that Herod is a family name. Herod the Great, who, he was the one that slaughtered the infants in Jesus' birth. He was the Edomine of the Maccabeans. And Mariomni was a descendant as well. But Mariomki was one of Herod's uh, eight wives. And one of at least six that he killed. But before she died, she gave Herod a son named Aristopolis. Aristopolis was one of at least 15 sons that Herod killed. They had a rumor in, in those days that it was not a good thing to be Herod's son or wife. Because they didn't last too long. But before Aristopolis died, he fathered a son by the name of Herod Agrippa. Realizing, Aristopolis did, that it was dangerous living in Jerusalem. With people all around him getting butchered left and right. Aristopolis' mother shipped her son, Agrippa, to Rome, where he became friends with a guy by the name of Caliglia. You might remember Caliglia from your history lessons. He was a terribly depraved man who, when he came into power, said, you know what, I'm going to put my buddy Herod Agrippa on the throne in Jerusalem. And so as we read here in Acts chapter 12, this is Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who remodeled the temple and who killed the babies at the time of Jesus' birth. And so this Herod stretches out his influence in order to harass some of those that were in the church. Now to harass is not just to get in the face. It's, it's really a verb form of the word evil. This is to do evil to somebody. And so Peter would be included in this harassing an interesting thing is, is that about 20 years later, in Peter's own epistle, Peter would, in reference, I think, to this event in Acts chapter 12, he would write in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Who is he that will harm you if you become that follower of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, then you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that it lies in you, with meekness and with fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ 
might be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than to do evil. And pay attention to what Peter's saying because guys, he's lived what he's teaching. He's lived what he's putting out. And so Herod here is on a torrent and then he killed, verse 2, James, the brother of John with the sword. Now there's two men, two, there's a lot more men named, but there's two real important men named James. There were men that were important to the early church. One was the half-brother of Jesus, who would eventually be recognized as the head of the church in Jerusalem, and he would also be the one that would write the book of James. But that's not this guy here in Acts chapter 12. This James was one of the 12 disciples, and one of the three disciples that were the closest to Jesus. He was a fisherman, along with his brother John, John, the author of the book of John. And they were sons of a man by the name of Zebedee, Matthew chapter 4. And when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter in Luke 8, it tells us that he was also one of the guys that saw it. That when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in, Jesus did, except for Peter, James, and John, along with his brother. James was one half of the sons of thunder, probably because of their temper. Like when he wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans in Luke 9. And along with John, he had once asked Jesus to make him one of the top guys in the kingdom. You remember that? Can I be on your side? And along with Peter and John, he saw Jesus at the transfiguration. And in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. And began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And now Herod has put James to death. You can imagine how devastating this was for the early church. One of the chief apostles is dead. And James is the first of the apostles to die for his faith. I mean, you can imagine people going, man, did I make the right decision? Did I do the right thing in, in accepting Christ and asking God to come into my heart? You know, look what the end result is. And it must have just been shattering in, in the, to a degree in the early church. And really all of them end up dying for their faith, except John, who somehow survived into an old age. Tradition, Eusebius and Clement, tells us that James was beheaded with a sword. And that when James's accuser saw his resolve and his courage as he was about to be executed, the accuser repented and joined James in being beheaded. But here, Herod wasn't done yet. And so verse 3 says, And because he saw it that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, and that puts a kind of kink on things. Herod Agrippa, this Edomim of his father's side, Jewish on his mother's side, was very interested in the Jewish culture. And he was deeply desirous of Jewish acceptance. He wanted to be accepted by these guys. But although he was circumcised and followed all the Jewish customs and rituals, the Jews never really embraced him as one of their own because they considered him as a half-breed at best. And so here in Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa finally, although perhaps quite accidentally, he gains the approval of the Jews by ordering James to be sawn in half lengthways. And he must have thought, at last, I found a way to get the Jews to like me. And he decided to go after Peter next. Herod is simply trying to score political points with the Jews by doing away with those that are their enemies. It's the time of Passover. Unleavened bread and Passover, those two feasts that go together. Passover being first, unleavened being the whole week that follows. And so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison. And he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him. Four squads or quaternions. Literally, it is four soldiers. And the worst criminal in those days would have only two soldiers, one chained to each arm. But Herod ordered four chained to Peter to make sure that Peter wouldn't escape. And intending to bring him before the people after Passover, after Easter, knowing it was against the Jewish law to kill a man during the Passover, he made his plan. 
And Herod Agrippa intended to wait after that in order to execute Peter. Now, the last time that Peter was arrested, you might remember, back in Acts chapter 5, verse 19, it didn't work out so well. It ended in the angel of the Lord opening the prison doors and bringing them out. This time, they're not taking any chances. And so verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Prayer was made on Peter's behalf. And what a difference it was going to make. It makes you wonder what you would have, you know, what perhaps would have happened had the believers been praying when James was in prison. You say, well, why didn't the church pray for James? Well, perhaps they thought like sometimes we think. Why pray? God's will is going to be done anyways. But the Bible says, James, by the way, chapter 4, verse 2, we have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. Why are we so dumb? Why do we have to learn the hard way? Why does there have to be difficulty? Why does there have to be sadness and tragedy before we say, you know what, we ought to pray. How many times we go, well, let's do this, or let's do, go to this person, ask them for help, or let's, you know, we can do this, and we make all these different plans and things like that before we've even had or taken an opportunity to pray. That should be the first thing that we do because it really, truly does make a difference. What difference does it make? Well, all I know is this. The church didn't pray for James and he was sawn in half. They prayed for Peter and he's about to be spared. You see, the Lord has sovereignly chosen to work through the avenue of prayer in order to teach us how to talk to him. And we're going to be talking to him for the next gazillion, bazillion, badrillion, whatever, all of eternity. But to depend on Him so that in the ages to come, when we rule on behalf of Him, we have already established and got communication down tight. But prayer does work, guys. And we're seeing it happen within the early church. Sometimes it can change things quickly and dramatically. But sometimes prayer changes things slowly and almost invisibly. Either way, though, prayer is powerful. And we've seen it already in the early church how much prayer was a part of what was going on. Even on the day of Pentecost, after a season of prayer, it says the Holy Spirit was poured out. When Peter healed that man in the temple, it was on the hour of prayer. When the apostles asked the church to set up deacons, they spent time in prayer for the selection process that God would be very much in the very center of it. And in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, It tells us concerning the early church leaders. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so we see here that the implication is that Peter's deliverance was directly related to it. Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, (laughs) that night Peter was doing what he does best. Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. This cracks me up. Here's Peter, sleeping again. Luke tells us that while Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, look it up, verse 32, Peter slept. Matthew writes that while Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter slept, Matthew 26. And here in Acts chapter 12, we see Peter asleep the night before his execution. We could call him the sleeping disciple. But I want you to know that this time it's different. It's different. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Yeah, are we good? So, this time it was different. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter slept because he didn't expect anything to happen. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he slept in disobedience to the Lord's command to pray for him, or with him. In prison, he slept because he was at total peace. At total peace. Put yourself, though, in Peter's chains. If you were bound to two soldiers... And you knew that you were going to be killed 
the next morning, what would you do? Well, we know what Peter did. Blanketed with the peace that passes all understanding, Peter was able to sleep in perfect peace. Now behold, verse 7, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. I was cracking up reading this because they were trying to determine exactly what striking Peter on the side and raising him up was. I think, I think it was the head. I think it was Peter, you know, because Peter was out. He was sleeping. He was having a good rest. Now, throughout Scripture, angels are almost always pictured as being in a hurry. Conversely, God is seen hurrying in only one place. You know where that one place was? It was in the person of the Father who ran down the road to welcome home his prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. But you look at it and you go, well, why do angels always seem to be rushing around? I think perhaps it's because angels understand human nature so well that they just want to come on the scene, do the work, and get out before those dumb human beings begin to worship them. Because they know they're not supposed to receive that. Well, the angel said, verse 8, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. And so he went in, out and he followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. Didn't know it was for real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter thought that he was either dreaming or he was seeing a vision. He he didn't really know what it was, but either way, it seemed unreal to him. And when they were past, verse 10, the first and the second uh, guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angels departed from them. Herein, guys, we see the first automatic door. Isn't that cool? And it opened to them of its own accord. And I imagine that this was part of what seemed somewhat unreal to Peter. He had never seen a door open by itself. It probably was a little bit like the Amish man seeing an elevator for the first time. An Amish boy and his father were visiting the mall. And they were amazed by almost everything they saw, but especially by two shiny silver walls that could move apart and back together again. And the boy asked his father, Father, what is this? And the father, having never seen an elevator himself, he responded, Son, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I don't know what it is. And while the boy and his father sat there watching wide-eyed, an older lady in a wheelchair rolled up to the moving walls. And she pressed the button. And the walls opened and the lady rolled between them into a small room. And the walls closed and the boy and his father watched the small circles of lights with the numbers above the walls light up and turn off and light up and turn off. And they continued to watch the circles light up in the reverse direction. And then all of a sudden the walls opened up again and a beautiful 24-year-old woman stepped out. The father looked at his son and said, son, go get your mother. (laughs) But the doors, the gate opened up. And when Peter had come to himself, snap out of it, Peter. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angels and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. What if Peter, sitting in prison, had said, wow, what a dream, and then just continued sitting there going back to sleep? He would have been dead before his time. You see, even though Peter wasn't sure what he was seeing was actual reality, he acted on it as if it were. And I wonder how many of us remained, and this is important, guys, how many of us remain imprisoned? Because although we hear teachings and we hear exhortations and prophecies and illuminations, although we take notes and we nod our heads in agreement, we just sit in our cells thinking they must be dreams. Our culture says take it easy, but Christianity says take a chance. We'll never experience what God intends us to enjoy until we follow what he lays on our hearts 
by stepping out in faith. Now, sometimes when we step out, we find it was only a vision after all, just a dream, and that's okay. You know, there's an interesting scripture in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. It says, an empty stable stays clean, but an empty stable brings no profits. Think about that. Some people say, you know, I've never messed up. I've never made the mistake of following a vision. Look how clean my barn is. The floor is spotless. But the farmer that has some metal muffins on the floor and a few flies swarming around is the one who is productive. Guys, follow the Lord's leading, even if it seems only like a vision. Because the worst that could happen is that a pasture patty or two could maybe appear in your barn. But the best that could happen is like Peter, you could be set free on some new adventure, some new thing that God is wanting to do. So God reaches down and he plucks Peter out of harm's way, but he didn't deliver James. Somehow we've gotten the idea that if we just have enough faith, that all our problems would disappear. But guys, it doesn't always work that way. In truth, sometimes the person who has faith has to go through problems, sometimes even to death. You know, you go and you look in Hebrews at the, the Heroes of Faith chapter, chapter 11. And in verse 33, it says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of the weakness, or out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight or fight the animal or flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Guys, faith is not about having magic power to get rid of all those problems, to get you out of those circumstances, to get you out of those situations. Faith is about trusting God, no matter what, no matter what takes place. You look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. They were threatened by King Nebuchadnezzar that they better bow down to his statue or else they were going to be thrown into the fiery flame. But they replied in Daniel 3.17, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which we, you have set up. How many of us have sold out for so much less when God's saying, man, I want to bless you big time? Go for it. Go for it, guys. Trust in him no matter what happens, no matter what takes place. Verse 12, so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who, whose surname was Mark. This is probably the same upper room used in the Last Supper on the day of Pentecost. But there were many that were gathered together and they were praying. Now keep in mind that at this time Barnabas and Saul are visiting Jerusalem and possibly staying with Mary. They may have been a part of this prayer meeting that's going on for Peter. And so here they are in that room. They're praying. There's a group of them. In verse 13 is Peter knocked on the door of the gate. A girl named Rhoda came to answer. Rhoda meaning Rose. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. She knew what Peter sounded like. She knew Peter's voice. She recognized the voice. But she didn't open the door. She ran back to tell everybody else. But they said to her, verse 15, you are beside yourself. The believers must have thought, Rose, you're a blooming idiot. That can't be Peter. You don't, don't you realize he's in prison? And they returned to their praying, Lord, 
Free Peter in Jesus' name. <laughs> Lord, we look to you to free Peter. Isn't this a great story? I mean, aren't these early believers just like you and I? I mean, here they are praying fervently for Peter's release while he's standing outside the very door. And yet, verse 15 goes on to say, she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, Rose, it's an angel. Now that's kind of intriguing because evidently these early believers were so accustomed to seeing angels that they didn't even bother to get up to see this one. Maybe they just, you know, they, you know, in the tomb they saw and then, they, you know, why even look? You know, we've seen one angel, you've seen them all, I guess. I don't know. Um, they had an awareness that the angels were all around and always there. But we've lost that awareness. Our eyes have become dull. And as a result, I think we're missing something because we don't really believe angels are here right now, perhaps. Well, poor Peter, verse 16 he continues knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him. And they were astonished. What? What are you doing here, Peter? <laughs> you prayed. <laughs> Don't you get, you know. You prayed, Peter. All right, pay, we, here are you guys. You prayed. You know, the story is told of a, a small town. It cracked me up where there's no liquor stores. Evidently, however, a, a nightclub was built right on the main street. And members of one of the churches in the area, they were so disturbed that they conducted several all-night prayer meetings and asked the Lord to burn down this den of iniquity. Lightning struck the tavern a short time later, and it was completely destroyed by the fire. The owner, knowing how the church people had prayed, sued them for damages. His attorney claimed that their prayers had caused the lost. The congregation, on the other hand, hired a lawyer and fought the charges. After much deliberation, the judge declared, it's the opinion of the court that wherever the guilt may lie, the tavern keeper is the one who really believes in prayer, while the church members don't. I mean, it does challenge the idea that God only answers according to our unwavering faith. Sometimes it seems that God answers in spite of what our faith is. But motioning to them, here's Peter, we're back at the gate. Guys, quiet. He motions to them, verse 17, with his hand to keep them silent. And he declares to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James. Now this is James, the half-brother of Jesus the author of the book of James, leader of the church of Jerusalem. Go tell James and the brethren. And he departed and he went to another place. Now this story encourages me a whole bunch because it shows that the Lord responds to prayer even when it's not accompanied by a huge, great deal of faith. These believers were praying. They were praying fervently. They were praying intensely, but you can't say they were praying the prayer of faith since they didn't even have enough faith to believe that Peter was free when he was knocking at the gate. I, I like this story because I find myself praying a lot like them. I can pray fervently. I can even pray intensely, but a lot of times I'm not sure anything's going to happen. You know what I mean? And this story tells me that that's okay. God can still work through a tiny smattering of faith. Jesus said faith that is the size of a mustard seed, just a tiny bit of faith can move mountains. Matthew 17. And if you have faith enough just to pray, things can happen, doors can open. Just ask Peter. You that might perhaps today feel imprisoned, boxed in, and as though nothing's happening in your life, guys, in your job, in your family, in your ministry, take heart and take hope. And pray anyways. Don't stop praying. Never stop praying. Because sometimes it takes only enough faith to pray for a miracle to happen. Step out in faith. Peter would later write these words. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 
1 Peter 3.12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. That's why Peter had peace. The ears of the Lord are open to prayer. That's why the church could pray and come together. But the face of the Lord is against evil. That's why Herod, we're going to see here, is about to perish. Verse 18. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become with Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went out from Judea to Caesarea. And he stayed there. Herod, infuriated by the news of Peter's escape, he leaves Jerusalem for the seacoast city of Caesarea, a town, this is kind of like a resort town, a beautiful city next to the beach in the Mediterranean. Caesarea was opulent and luxurious. But watch now what happens to Herod. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were two cities located in present-day Lebanon. And the people were remnants of the old Phoenician Empire. Now, we don't know why Herod was displeased with them at this point, but we do know that his displeasure would have been bad news for them because it was basically a non-agrarian community. So as being such, they depended on getting their food from Herod. And so they came to him in one accord, verse 20 goes on to say, And having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. And so when this delegation from Tyre and Sidon arrived, they somehow persuaded Blastus, the Herod's chief of staff, to make an appointment for them. And for some reason, Herod was punishing these cities with some sort of economic embargo. So they hired this guy to act as a lobby that they might come to him. And so verse 21 goes on. On a day, or on a set day, Herod, arrayed in his royal apparel. And guys, Jewish historian Josephus tells us Herod's royal robes were actually made of pure silver threads. A gown that would have made even Elton John envious. But he sat on his throne, and he gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. The voice of a god and not of a man. In need of Herod's bread. What did the delegation do? They buttered him up. You're a god. You're a god, they shouted. But you know, flattery is like bubblegum. You can enjoy it for a moment, but don't swallow it. More often than not, when someone flatters you, they are attempting to get something from you which is exactly what was happening here. Verse 23, Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And this is gross, guys. Close your ears if you're weak. And he was eaten by worms and died. Sounds like a horror flick, you know? Eh, 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 worms, you know? Here's Herod arrayed in his splendor, glistening in the Mediterranean sun, drinking in the praise of the people, and he's suddenly eaten by worms. Now, whether they were worms that were, you know, actually externally beginning to eat his flesh, or whether, as Josephus suggests, that Herod, struck with severe intestinal pains, died five days later, and during the autopsy, his insides were found to be full of worms. We can't be sure, just speculation. Whether the worms ate him from the inside out or from the outside in. But either way, you can believe that it was gross. But the Lord doesn't tell us this to gross us out. He tells us this to fill us in. For I believe the purpose of this account is to teach us the absolute necessity of giving the glory unto the Lord. It belongs to him. You know, when we talk about giving God glory... People get really confused. You know, why do we need to give God glory? I mean, is he insecure? Does he have a poor self-image? Does he need us to gather together to tell him how wonderful he is so that he'll feel better about himself? No, 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 and no. God doesn't need us. 
He does love us. You know, and he doesn't need us, though. And he doesn't need our praise. You know, the reality is that we need to praise. He knows it is in thanksgiving. He knows that it's in glorifying him that, in a sense, we are dewormed. He knows that. Like Herod, if we don't honor him, the worms will destroy us. So for you note takers, there are three worms that will torment us, gnaw on us, and ultimately devour us if we don't give God glory and thanksgiving without ceasing. The first worm is the worm of anxiety. Paul wrote that in everything we are to give thanks unto the Lord, Ephesians 5.20. Why? Because James wrote in chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. Above. If I think the job I have or the house that I live in, the family I enjoy are mine because I've worked hard. I've worked hard for the money. You know, and I've been clever and I've been diligent. If I think that, I'm going to, be, and you are, going to eventually be eaten up by the worm of anxiety. Because I will either be worried about maintaining what I have or attaining what I don't have. Maintaining what I, don't, or what I have or attaining what I don't have. If I say I have health because of my commitment to physical fitness. I hit the gym twice a day. Or I have success because of my business acumen. And a position on the baseball team because of my athletic prowess. Guys, if that's where I'm coming from, I will be consumed by worry because if I strive to attain these things, I'll have to strive to maintain these things. If you have to strive to attain something, you're going to have to strive to maintain it. If you believe that you're where you are today because of your diligence, your ability, your personality, your creativity... You will be eaten up with anxiety. On the other hand, if you believe that every good gift comes from above, you realize you neither earned it nor deserve the blessings in your life. What do you have but what has been given? And if it's been given, why do you go around boasting as if it's something that you came up with in and of yourself? It doesn't work that way. You see... If you believe, though, every gift comes from above, you realize that you neither earned it or deserve it, those blessings in your life. And since you didn't work for them, since they are yours by God's grace, you can trust Him and trust in Him. And you can give Him thanks for where you are today. Then, guys, if the job doesn't work out or if the relationship goes sour, if you get cut from the team, you can say, Lord, you gave it to me in the first place. And if you're taking it away from me now, then I know it's ultimately, that doesn't mean that you're not working hard. It's not meaning that you're not investing time and doing things like that. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about if you're boasting, if you're saying, I am the one that did this. I'm the one that caused this to happen. You're going to find yourself in a world of anxiety. But if you realize that, man, Lord, every good gift is from you. And that way, if it goes away. If you get cut from the team, if you find yourself, you know, having it taken away from you. You know, you realize you have a peace that it's for ultimately your good and your glory. The glory of God. And when you thank the Lord for whatever situation you're in, when you give him the glory for everything you've enjoyed, you will be at peace. That wonderful peace that passes all understanding. It happens. Philippians 4, 7. Miriam led the children of Israel in praise and worship as they danced and they celebrated after God miraculously did what? Part of the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. But do you recall what the children of Israel were doing before the Lord parted the sea? They were complaining, they were murmuring, Exodus chapter 14, verse 11. They were stressed out to the max, they were uptight. They were eaten up. 
How much better it would have been for the people to dance before the Lord and give glory to him before the Red Sea parted. While they were trapped and boxed in by the sea in front of them and the Egyptians behind them. It's it's relatively easy to give thanks after the answer has come. But how much better for your health, for your faith, your witness, if you'll take up the tambourine in faith before you see the Red Sea part in your life and watch the worm of anxiety drown in those waters of praise. Number two, the worm of perversity. Romans chapter one, verse 18. It gives us that pathway to per, uh, perversion. And you might remember that downward spiral we talked about when we were going through Romans chapter 1. But in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them. For God hath showed it to them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools." And they changed the glory of the incorruptible incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affliction. For even their women did it change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. When a man, when a woman or a society stops glorifying God, stops giving him thanks, where do you think we are with that in America? We're beyond. We are seriously in, in the red zone. But when a society stops glorifying God and giving him thanks, perversion is the ultimate result. You know, we may not make idols of men and birds of wood and stone as they did in Paul's day, but we fashion rock idols, Hollywood idols, political idols. We may not worship creeping things and four-footed animals anymore, but we teach our kids that they came from primordial slime and evolved into monkeys. We are surrounded in this country by perversity that leads to homosexuality, and God's judgment inevitably. And according to Romans chapter 1 verse 21. It all began when we stopped. Giving thanks. To God. I'm sorry about our culture. I take responsibility for it. And repent. To the Lord concerning, concerning it. Because there's a part that we play in all of this. Like Herod. Our society is being devoured by the worm of perversity, because as a nation, we refuse to glorify God. Worm number three, the worm of negativity. A man or a woman who does not continually give thanks in everything becomes vulnerable to that worm of negativity. He or she will become grumpy, grouchy, and cynical. The way to escape from the worm of negativity is to give thanks to God continually. In the late 1800s, when cotton was the undisputed king of the South, every cotton plantation in Coffee County, Alabama, was wiped out by the bull evil, our bull evil. The economic fallout was disastrous, causing the Christians in the little town of Enterprise to meet together and pray. We thank you, Lord, that 
You have blessed us for so many years with cotton. Now it's gone. But we know that you work all things together for good for those that love the Lord. Following their prayer meeting, the town of Enterprise decided to change crops from cotton to peanuts. Now, although peanuts at that time were virtually unknown, there was a man of exceptional intelligence, one of the greatest thinkers in our country's history, who in the same year, the folks, the, the folks there at Enterprise felt the Lord nudging them to plant peanuts, was also talking to the Lord. He was a wonderful believer with a deep interest in astronomy. And he prayed, Father, Father, teach me the secrets of the universe. And he just left at that for a few minutes. But then he hung his head and he said, Lord, I know that's somewhat presumptuous to ask for. So just teach me about the peanut. The man's name, of course, was George Washington Carver. And how the Lord answered his prayer. Beginning in 1895, Carver developed over 300 products from the lowly peanut. Of which the primary discovery, as far as I'm concerned, was peanut butter. (laughs) As a result, George Washington Carver's discovery, suddenly there was an unexpected, unprecedented demand for peanuts. And Coffee County began to prosper beyond belief. What had been a disaster became a blessing. What had been an adversary and an adversity became prosperity. All because instead of being eaten up by the worm of negativity, the people of Enterprise did what? They prayed, but what else did they do? Glorified God, gave thanks to God. Makes all the difference in the world. All the difference. And if you go to Enterprise today, you'll see a monument in the town square. BLM didn't tear this one down. But you'll see a monument with a bow weevil on top and the inscription beneath it in profound appreciation for the bow weevil and what he has done as the herald or what he has done as the herald of prosperity. This monument is erected by grateful citizens of Coffee County, Alabama. And then it says all things work together for good. So guys, I say that simply because you and I can be dewormed simply by giving God thanks and giving God the glory. And may he give us wisdom and appreciation. And may this be the most unwormy congregation in the whole country. Amen. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Herod was struck down. The word of God was just taken off. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And we'll see how that story develops as we continue on. Amen. Amen. Father, what a blessing, Lord, just to see your word come alive for us. The Father, as you just... uh, Open up your heart to us. And we consider these truths about anxiety and, Lord, just the things that that weigh us down when we don't give thanks, when we don't bring and give to you the glory and the honor and the praise. What a difference, Lord, it makes when we give you thanks, when we recognize you, when we point to the fact that what do we have but what we've been given. And all good gifts come from above. Lord, help us, stop us in our tracks when we begin to say things like, wow, look what I accomplished. Look what I've created. Look what I've done. Because, Lord, it's not about what we've done. It's about what you've done. And you started it, Lord, a long time ago. But when you went to the cross and you died and you gave and shed your blood, Lord, and you took the pain, the sorrow, the suffering, that, Father, we might live. We're nothing apart from you, but with you, we can do all things. And I just pray that for anyone that's listening this morning, that's struggling, you know, with anxiety, that's struggling, you know, with these other issues in their life that is just are weighing them down, wiping them out. Lord, just to to deal with these things, you know, on their own is just, you know, near to impossible. 
that perversity, that negativity, that anxiety. Especially, Lord, you know, with what's going on around us. We need you desperately. We don't just need you as a, as a pocket good luck charm. We don't just need you as just someone to have just in case, like fire insurance. We desperately need you. We need to give you complete control. We need to surrender our lives to you, to be led by you, to be moved by your Holy Spirit, empowered to live the life that, Lord, you've commanded for us to live. We need desperately. We need you, Lord. And so if there's anybody here this morning or on the internet that doesn't know you, Father, I just encourage them. And I pray, God, that you would speak to their hearts as only you can, that you would convict by your Holy Spirit and draw them unto yourself. And Father, you said that if we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Lord, let us be those that are counted among the men and the women, the children that has said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We know that we're not perfect, but Lord, we're thankful. Help us to remember that, to be thankful for the strength and the ability, Lord, that you give to us to live a life sanctified, consecrated and set apart for you. Come into our lives. Be our Lord, our Savior. Forgive us. Cleanse us. For oh Lord, we love you. And we just ask these things now in Jesus' most precious, precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good time. Good times. Let's uh let's limp limp over to the stool and let's worship the Lord and let's receive the offering this morning. You guys feel fed? Yes, sir. Good. Good, good, good. God is good. <clears throat> there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah.
house of the Lord today with the family, and I pray that you'll take God's word with you this week into your world. Remember to pray for Maggie and the family, the loss of Daryl. Pray that you'll be with us this week as the Samaritan's Purse program is carried out again at noon until 8 p.m. We could use some help here at the church. Let's pray together. Father, it's just been so good to be in your presence today. We thank you for the message that you brought to us. And as we go our separate ways today, Lord, we pray that we would carry this message to a sin-sick world. Help us always, always to be alert, to be a witness, to show the grace, the mercy the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we take the offering today and we want it to go for your use. Bless it. Use it to further your kingdom. Now go with us our separate ways this week. Watch over us. Be in the the work that is done here. Bring in the workers. Bring in the, the shoe boxes, Lord, and bless them. And may your Holy Spirit work through this ministry. We love you so much. Again, thank you for all you do. And Lord, help us to be the reason someone smiles this week. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. What's up? You leaving?